Welcome back, everybody, to our seminar series, Digital Twins for Cities, hosted by Chalmers University at the Digital Twin City Center. My name is Ben Ketzler. I'm the center coordinator and your host for this seminar series. Unfortunately, we already have our last seminar today. We'll talk about opportunities for circularity. Uh, as always, feel free to ask questions in the chat, and um, the session will be available on YouTube uh, after we finish this session. Again, I have some support here, and this time I'm going to actually switch roles. My colleague Andreas Hanning from uh, Chalmers uh, uh, in the three technique, uh, the project manager in the Circular Economy Group, is going to help out moderating the session. And he has been so far in the background, actually, running the, uh, the technology behind the seminar. And today we switch roles, so I will handle the technology, and Andreas will moderate. So Andreas is in the next room. I'll ask him to come over now. And uh, we're social distancing here so that, uh, uh, yeah, here he is. <laughs> hey, Andreas. Hey, Bernd. Um, actually, it's yeah, Bernd Kitzlinger. Like to... So this is me, Andreas Haneng, working on circular economy here at Chalmers Industry Technique. Thank you very much, Andreas. Well, the room is yours now. I'll uh, go uh, into the background now, the backstage, and the show is yours. Enjoy. Thank you, Ben. So for today, we've got, I'm starting here, and today we've got three interesting uh, speakers, and we're going to listen to Mark Enser first, and then Chris Jackson, Jackson and uh, finally, we're going to listen to Khadija Benes, who will be talking today about opportunities for circularity when it comes to digital twins. Uh, but we are going to start talking with uh, Mark, Mark Enser, who's from the uh, Center for Digital Built Britain, and he's the head of the National Digital Twin program there. And uh, Mark, and it says in, in your web page as well, that uh, digital twin can be a great enabler for circular economy. And just before I invite you on stage here, uh, Mark, I'm going to add you there. Hi there, Mark. Just to, to start off, one, there are several uh, definitions of a circular economy, but one important uh, definition talks about designing out waste, designing out material, uh, using materials more efficiently, using products more efficiently, and also restoring our environments. And uh, what I can see, there are many of these uh, things that you've added and, and talk about in the in in your program as as important aspects that can also be connected to a digital twin yeah that's exa exactly right i hope i can touch on a few of those in the uh, in the presentation but i, I, I realize there's not much time so i'm going to scoot through it and maybe we can come back to some other points in the in the um in the chat Super. So uh, we're going to have uh, each of the speakers are going to have a couple of minutes. I'm going to invite you to the stage right now, uh, Mark, but ask questions in the chat in YouTube and we will bring those uh, questions to the discussion with, which will follow all of the presentations. So, Mark, the stage is yours and I'm going to add your presentation there and it's Brilliant. the stage is yours. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much indeed for inviting me. It's, it's brilliant to share on this subject, which I think, I think is hugely important. Uh, what, what I'd like to do um, is show how um, a national digital twin program, uh, it can be a key enabler of the circular economy. Um, and, and so, um, as I mentioned, I've got, got loads of slides to, to scoot through. But, but um, uh, what the key point I'd like to get across really um, is to do with uh, seeing the built environment um, as a system of systems because I think that it's only with the systems view that we can then start to address the uh, systemic challenges um, and I think that these uh, systems-based challenge, challenges demand systems-based solutions so climate change, uh, you know, achieving net zero, achieving resilience, uh, circular economy, all of these things are systems based challenges. Uh, and so we need a systems view to, to address them. Um, what I'll be doing is calling quite heavily um, on this document, uh, a vision document that came out last week. Uh, so rather than run through it uh, just now, I'll just uh, give the link to it uh, and commend it to you. Uh, but I'll be picking up on quite a bit of the thinking fr from this document. Um, and the vision really is about having a built environment whose explicit purpose um, is to enable people and nature 
to flourish together for generations uh, and needing to recognize it um, as a system to do that. So there's the built systems, there's the natural systems. Uh, hopefully there's also the cyber physical systems uh, that come together uh, in an effective system of systems that serve both people and nature. And I think within that system, or this system of systems actually, uh, we can see all sorts of um, really interesting and relevant processes. I think the one at the center is the main one. It's to do with the use of the built environment because that's closest uh, to providing the services that actually deliver the outcomes we want. But in order to make the built environment available for use, uh, uh, operation and maintenance is, is clearly key. Uh, and then every now and again, uh, we need to kick off interventions. So planning, designing, building, commissioning. But I think it's really helpful to see that as an intervention on the system uh, rather than something that is isolated and, and on its own. Uh, and I think it's only when we start to see this bigger picture and how interconnected it is mm. that then we can uh, start to address um, circular economy. Uh, we can't address the circular economy uh, in silos. Um, and I think when we see this picture um, of the systems providing services and the services delivering outcomes, uh, then we're seeing the, the big picture uh, within which um, the circular economy makes sense. Um, so just to tell us the, the story, uh, I think, of the kind of the multi-layered nature uh, of our built environment. I'll, I'll go through this really quickly. But we can see that uh, each, each layer is itself a complex interconnected system. We can definitely see that with transport, uh, whether we're talking about rail or road or air. We can say the, say the same kind of thing about energy, a complex interconnected system, which is becoming more complex and more interconnected uh, as we move to having prosumers, uh, as we move towards uh, you know, recognizing that transport is, is basically just about, uh, about energy. Uh, telecoms, very similarly, is a complex interconnected system uh, on which all the other systems uh, rely. Uh, and you can see water very often hidden uh, but again, itself a complex interconnected system that relies on energy uh, and transport and telecoms. Uh, and then we get to waste, which is really interesting, isn't it? Because at the moment, that seems to be uh, a bit of a, a, a linear process um, where we do seem to use things once and, and then throw them away. Um, but we can imagine that this becomes more complex and interconnected where we don't see uh, anything as waste, we see everything as resource. Uh, and so it comes back, uh, back at us. Uh, then there's the social infrastructure, uh, which makes no sense unless all those other systems are working, uh, residential, commercial, industrial buildings, and then the interface with the natural environment. You add all that together and you get the built environment. So hopefully I'm, I'm kind of making the point that what we have in our built environment uh, is a complex interconnected system of systems. And it's really only when we see that, that we can then start to address these systems problems. It's only when we see that, that we can imagine a cyber physical system uh, where we bring digital and physical together uh, in pursuit of better outcomes for people and nature. Uh, but we can't even see that uh, unless we see the system in the first place. Uh, and it's really in this context that I think digital twins start to become useful. Um, at, at their root, digital twin is, is really just about connecting uh, a model with the thing that it's being that is being modeled. Uh, and it's a, a kind of a dynamic data connection that does that, uh, that enables us to generate better insights, to drive better decisions, uh, to drive better interventions in the physical world. Uh, and then what becomes quite interesting is when we see many different digital twins uh, of many different things for many different purposes, but then we can start to consider uh, connecting them together. And the connection between them is a data connection. And so now we're talking about connected digital twins, but we can zoom out and see bigger connections, connections between uh, different modes of transport, energy, tran uh, energy, sorry, <laughs> different modes of transport like rail, road and, and air. Uh, and we can describe an ecosystem of connected digital twins. We can zoom out again and see that, that ecosystem uh, involving uh, cross-sector data connections between energy and transport and water. Um, and we think, and this is part of the, the program at uh, the Centre for Digital Built Britain, um, that uh, that kind of ecosystem needs to be coordinated because otherwise it could create some kind of uh, N-squared data sharing um, chaos. 
Um, and and that's, that's really what um, our program is about. But what it's all uh, enables uh, are systems-based solutions. Uh, and this, I think, is, is where um, the contribution to the circular economy uh, is so important. You know, we can imagine uh, not just managing assets through single life cycles, uh, but managing resources through multiple life cycles. It's something that the built environment doesn't do just yet, uh, but with uh, the aid of digital twins, uh, we can see how that, that would be, be possible. Uh, we can also see um, how it would then be possible to design for more than just building, uh, but design for manufacturing assembly, which is uh, gaining a, a lot of traction at the moment in the UK, but also designing for operation or designing for maintenance, designing for all of those processes that I showed on the uh, on the earlier um, earlier image. And then we can move beyond that and into the place that we need to get to for circular economy, uh, which is designing for repurposing, designing for recycling, designing for, for, for reuse, um, so that it's part of the overall connected processes rather than something that is just done in isolation. Uh, and I, and I, I said at the top that this is my main point, is for us to see the built environment uh, as a system of systems. And it's only when we do that, that we can properly start to imagine a circular economy uh, in the built environment. And having a competent tool, like an ecosystem of connected digital twins, uh, becomes um, a key enabler of that. So I think with that, I'd just like to uh, say, say thank you and hand over. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, really interesting to uh, to listen to. I'm going to remind uh, everyone who is watching this on, on YouTube that you can start asking questions uh, in the chat so that you can add and you can add them to or ask anyone uh, who's uh, been presenting or uh, directly to if you want to ask a question to Mark, just write question to Mark and, and add it and then we will uh, then we will bring them in later on. But uh, first of all, thank you, Mark. Let's go to uh, the next presenter. We've got Chris Jackson uh, coming in, from uh, who is Head of Commercial uh, commercial Markets and Sustainability at Esri UK. Welcome, to Chris. Hi, Andreas. So, nice to be here. Perfect. I see and I hear that you are uh, a geographer as well. And uh, as you mentioned yourself, that you see the interconnections uh, between different aspects. And we heard that from Mark mentioning uh, interconnections being really important. And uh, also from, I would say, adding geography, then we're talking about ecosystem services, which is also a really important aspect on a circular economy when thinking about how can we regenerate our natural environment and, and improve the environment, not just using it, but also improving it. So uh, it's going to be interesting to listen to you. And I'm going to hand over the stage uh, to you, Chris. OK, great. Thank you, Andreas. And thank you to Bernd and Andreas again for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, and to congratulate the speakers from the other seminars for all of their thoughtful and inspiring talks. I'm really pleased to be here. And um, yeah, I work for Esri, a global technology services uh, company with a, a singular focus on furthering geographic science with a goal to help governments, scientists, businesses and communities better manage our world. And we have a software platform called ArcGIS. And I thought I'd turn the seminar title a little bit on its head, maybe be a bit controversial early in the, in the afternoon um, by calling my paper Why City Circularity Needs a Geospatial Digital Twin. Because whilst it's OK to think of this as an opportunity, um, I actually think, and similar to Mark, I think, that digital twins are critical to the success of city circularity. So let's dig into it. Um, and again, uh, Andres, you, you, you made a great quote at the beginning. The circular economy is this systemic approach to development. It's restorative and regenerative by design. Um, and it's an attempt to replicate or mimic a natural system. Uh, so it takes cues from nature um, and it recognises the interconnectedness of all things, both natural and man-made. And that's a key concept here because success relies in part on dissolving or blurring the boundaries that we create between various parts of the urban supply chain. And I'll come back to that later. Um, but as you mentioned, the three principles, designing out waste and pollution, keeping products in use longer and improving the environments through that regenerative process. 
Now, uh, geography is the science of our world and provides a way to organize and integrate our knowledge. Um, geographic information systems abstract geography, bringing together virtually all types of geospatial content and analytics, again, whether natural or man-made, and connect, model, and visualize our world, creating a platform for understanding and intelligent action. So GIS in this way provides us with a process and a framework, uh, a context for creating, applying, and sharing our geographic knowledge everything from measuring, visualizing, analyzing, decision-making. It's sort of an extension to the knowledge hierarchy in that sense, turning data into information, into knowledge, and then action. And for over 50 years, government scientists and organizations have been using GIS to understand the world around us, in a way, contributing to the creation of like a, a planetary digital twin, you know, the ultimate digital twin of all time. So we've actually been in the business of creating digital twins since the late 1960s, um, mostly modeling the natural world, uh, increasingly to understand conservation efforts and environmental protection, and more recently to model the interactions and interconnectedness of human activity with the natural world. And this is where, as Marx said, we need to start integrating, collaborating with many digital twins, hence the emergence of utility network modeling, GeoBIM, uh, and even human movement modeling in the city context. And all of this work, of course, has been supported by adjacent technologies, of the Internet of Things, the sensor web, telematics, satellite imagery, machine learning, and now AI, modeling progressively from 2D to 3D, 4D, all the Ds, in fact. Um, but the real strength here is the use of geography and mapping as the common context and framework to interconnect and integrate all these models enabling a more holistic understanding. In some ways, you could envisage it as like a portal through which we can dive into any of the detailed information models that we need to understand a particular object, phenomenon, or workflow. GIS is also advancing in the sense that engagement hubs are changing the collaboration pattern between organizations and citizens. It's opening up participation in a community using maps and a system of engagement. It's also empowering citizens to do GIS themselves, leveraging community content and crowdsourcing. And this means that organically, communities will emerge with tools that encourage more participation with government, which has been consistently one of the voiced challenges of moving towards a circular economy, that collaboration and engagement. Finally, geospatial technology has never been easier to integrate and interoperability is accelerating, in fact. Um, our system is designed to be open from the ground up, and we've been working really hard to develop ways of ingesting massive volumes of real-time data, leveraging technologies like Kubernetes, and continuing to work to support the Opal Geospatial, uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium. So we return to my, maybe my controversial title uh, that city circularity depends upon a geospatial digital twin. Um, the natural systems that circular economies aim to mimic have no artificial boundaries, no competing agendas, no shareholder profits or politics. It just works. Uh, and each phase of the cycle seamlessly interconnects with the next. So in our human and city construct, with so many different stakeholders involved in each of these phases of circularity, we definitely need something to help us collaborate, engage, and pass the key information from one phase to the next very analogous to the BIM building life cycle in that respect. The success of circularity, therefore, in, in my opinion, relies upon stakeholder collaboration and engagement and the agreement to use a framework to pass the information along, because this will help to create that continuous cycle. Otherwise, we break the chain and it potentially fails. And since the circular economy is all about movement of materials, goods and people across a variety of networks, spaces and places in the real world, all deeply interconnected. Well, no doubt, you'd expect me to say that it follows that a digital twin must be made geospatially aware. And here's some of the evidence of the successful use of that concept, the geospatial digital twin for sustainable development in the city of Uppsala's citizen engagement platform, enabling all stakeholders to contribute to the development plan, accessing a consistent set of information using easy to use maps and models all deeply connected in the background, but presented in a way that makes it easy for people to communicate and collaborate. 
So I guess in summary, I hope you now might um, understand or maybe even appreciate my view that city digital twins are inherently geospatial. Um, they must integrate many different information models to replicate the dynamics of a real city. And in the same way, city circular economies are also geospatial, um, applying systems thinking to envision, in, envision sustainable and thriving communities, helping us to mimic the natural system um, in an intrinsically human and, and man-made environment. So Andreas, I hope that provides a bit of context around geospatial. Uh, I welcome any questions. I'll look forward to the discussion later on. Thank you. So Chris, uh, thank you very much. I really enjoy the perspective and the, uh, and, and the examples. And I, I, uh, one thing stuck in, in my mind, and that was your comment on, on finding the, the ultimate model, the, the planetary scale uh, digital twin. Uh, so coming from a physics background, um, the, the holy grail of physicists would be the theory for everything, where you combine both gravity and, and and then quantum uh, theory. But here, when talking about the digital twin, uh, you would say it would be really interesting to have the planets, but would it even be possible to make such mm. a digital twin? Do you know, we, we know so little still about our planet, um, about the species, about their interconnectedness, about you know how um, species and how weather and climate all interact with one another. There's so much we still have to learn. But the important thing is that we start. You know, uh, we, we have to get on with building this series of twins that can be interconnected and integrated because, you know, otherwise we never stand a chance of really changing the way that we understand the world around us. And therefore, we never ch stand a chance to change things for the better, really. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. I see there are a couple of questions that have uh, come in, but we're going to take them in the discussion after all of you have presented so that all of you will also have the possibility to discuss the questions. So thank you, Chris. Okay. And uh, let's go to our third uh, speaker today, to Khadija Benis. Khadija, uh, hi, welcome on stage. Thank you. So, uh, Okay, I was out of focus there. So, uh, and welcome to the stage. You come from uh, an organization called C5 Lab. And uh, I understand that you're working, uh, we've got the 5C, there's very much connected to uh, concrete at the moment. Uh, so we're gonna have an interesting presentation from, uh, from you as well, where you're a research associate at C5 Lab. But I also wanted to uh, connect to, uh, to previous things that you've been working on as well. The fact that uh, you also work with passive houses and there we can really talk about reducing the energy consumption to a minimum or even when you start talking about plus energy houses that you could, could have uh, infras or uh, the built environment producing energy instead of using it. And also thinking about how can we build a building stock that can last for a longer time. And I would also like to uh, address what you've been working on uh, integrating uh, integrating agriculture into uh, the city context as well, which is very interesting, but also very difficult because then you end up in in different rules and how could you add agriculture in an ur urban setting as well and thinking of all of those aspects as well. So, uh, with that said, uh, Khadija, it's going to be interesting to listen to your uh, talk, and the stage is yours. Thank you, Andreas. Um... Thank you for, for having me in this seminar series. It's bringing so many fascin fascinating topics to the table and so many exciting and brilliant speakers. Uh, so today, so you mentioned many things I've been working on, but today I'm, I'm going to present the work that we've been doing lately uh, in Lisbon. Uh, this has been done in partnership with the cement industry and with some academic institutions. And we are basically working on quantifying the, the potential of concrete buildings to act as, uh, as carbon sinks. Um, this is one component of the, of the Lisbon Digital Twin. Other members of our group are looking at other, um, um, other components like energy systems, transports, um, and other components of the built environment. So focusing on buildings here, uh, so as we know, buildings are responsible for 39% uh, of global uh, energy-related greenhouse gas emissions, and 28% of these uh, emissions are embodied in materials and construction processes. And also we know that by 
2050, the world's population is expected to reach 10 billion, and the global building stock is actually projected to double um, in size. And the embodied emissions uh, will be responsible for half of the entire carbon footprint um, of new construction between now and 2050. And this will, of course, threaten to consume a significant share of our uh, remaining carbon budget. And then at the same time, we know that concrete is the most widely uh, used building material um, worldwide, mainly due to the, its vers versatility, robustness, and low cost. And the binder in concrete is cement, and, and the most common type, which is Portland cement, is produced by mixing limestone with other materials and burning them at around 1400 degrees uh, Celsius in, in a kiln. And such high temperatures make clinker production high, highly energy and carbon uh, intensive. And then as a result, we know that cement is one of the most polluting industries globally. But then there is also this important phenomenon that we are actually looking at, which is that cement-based products uh, such as concretes and mortars also gradually reabsorb uh, atmospheric uh, carbon through carbonation. Um, that happens throughout their whole lifetime. And carbonation is a well-documented document, physic, uh, physiochemical process uh, that is more and more investigated by the scientific community. There are many um, papers out there, um, uh, very recent papers, but then this has not yet been integrated into carbon in inventories, and that's what we are trying to do. So we know that on the one hand, uh, cement, concretes, and mortars are produced constantly, and they are constantly releasing emissions into the atmosphere. But then, on the other hand, uh, CO2 is also gradually being absorbed in all concrete that has been produced and that is still in use and can still carbonate. And that happens at different rates during primary life, end of life, and secondary uh, use. So what we want to do in Portugal, we want to quantify the, the potential of the na national building stock to act as a carbon sink, but that's roughly uh, three and a half million buildings. So what we did was starting with the with the pilot first for the city of Lisbon, which has around uh, five yeah, half a million buildings. And what we want to do is do something that can be a re replicable model that we, we can then extend to other uh, municipalities. And so to model this, we are applying a dig digital twin approach where we are building a dynamic uh, spatial, spatial model of the city that is based on GIS data sets uh, that contain building geometries and construction properties. And, and then upon this building, we are applying our, car our carbon uptake model, which is based on state-of-the-art literature on calculations and using a life cycle perspective. So the objective here is twofold. We want to have a, a rigorous carbon inventory of the building stock that not only considered um, embodied carbon, but also the, the carbon uptake that is not being quantified right now. And then using the di digital twin approach, which is a dynamic model that can be updated and allows us to visualize the carbon, the carbonation potential of various uh, areas of the city. So I'm not, I can, Unfortunately, I cannot go much into details in, in such a short presentation, but basically just wanted to, yeah, just to note here that basically the data sets on construction properties that we had, um, of course, were complemented with a deeper research on exact, uh, existing building typologies in Portugal and how each one of them incorporates uh, cement-based uh, building components. And then based on that, we could apply uh, the carbon uptake model, which takes into account different types of exposure areas, exposure classes, and their corresponding uh, carbonation rates. Just to show an example um, uh, of, of what we can visualize in our model. So for example, I'm going to show here a neighborhood in the city center, which has a fair a variety of building archetypes. And then for each building, we know uh, its construction period, we know the composition of its structure, the type of envelope coding, the roof type. And then based on this on its geometry, we can extract uh, its different exposed areas and apply the, the carbon uptake model to know how much CO2 has been absorbed by each surface and how much can still be absorbed in, in its remaining lifetime and know the state um, um, 
the actual state of our building and and being able to simulate scenarios for for urban interventions basically and so this is a just a mock-up of the of the final platform that we are aiming to provide where the user can select an area any area of the city and then visualize information um, about its buildings like state of of conservation of, of different building components embodied emissions carbon uptake during primary life and then the potential uptake at the end of life and then being able to do some scenario making for for urban interventions and this is um part of, of an effort that is being made to have a digital tool twin that contains um, an exhaustive carbon inventory and then information that can be used uh, for informed decision making for, for urban renewal uh, processes, for example. Um, and well, this is all for today. Um, thank you for your attention and please send me an email or, or let me know if you have any questions in the chat and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you. Karidia, thank you very much for uh, that presentation. Really interesting listening to the fact that uh, that concrete could be uh, and buildings uh, could also be seen as as a CO two uptake uh, when you're more uh, accustomed to hearing that it's uh, very much connected to the production of the the, the concrete and, and the emissions of CO two that come from from uh, from that part. But uh, let's make sure that we get everyone on stage. For uh, for the questions, and uh, uh, there we go. Welcome back, all of you. Uh, I see there was an interest in in just continuing the the start of an, an interesting discussion on on uh, that uh, planetary scale perspective. So uh, both me and Bant, we work at a, a company called the uh, called Chalmers Industry Technique or Chalmers Industrial Technology, but we also have a, a, a first actual part of that word, which is the foundation, Chalmers Industry Technique. So we are actually a foundation. And when thinking about foundation, that uh, gets me started to think about uh, the uh, author Isaac Asimov and his foundation trilogy, which is uh, a science fiction book thinking about the humanity in the future, but where his, his theory helps guiding the future. So could this kind of planetary scale digital twin help us guide ourselves into the future? What are your take on uh, on, on that? Uh, maybe Mark or Chris could could start with a comment on a planetary digital twin. I, mean, I, could, I could start by commenting on Isaac Asimov, actually, because uh, I mean, strangely, um, th that is our model for the um, our theory of change. <laughs> we're doing we're doing that. <laughs> We're just reading his books and doing what he suggested. Um, so, so yeah, on the uh, the planetary digital twin, I mean, I, I, I totally see the value of that, and, and actually the necessity of it. it it's just that I, I don't think it's one twin. Uh, what your know, one massive twin of everything sounds like a nightmare to me. Uh, whereas um, a federation uh, of twins sounds totally doable. And so I, I think that's the, the context that we should be considering. You know, it's, a, it's an ecosystem of connected digital twins. And what we need to work out is how to minimize the friction in data sharing between them. Uh, and and you know, that will be the key enabler uh, of federation. Uh, and, and then that means we can have an ecosystem of connected digital twins that enable us to, uh, to look at it at a planetary scale. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, I'll pick up on Mark's point. He makes an excellent point. And, and I love, by the way, how science fiction turns into reality. It's one of my favorite, favorite things that, you know, all of the, all of the great science fiction novels have always almost turned out to be true in the sense that we make it happen. Um, and I agree. I mean, the, the concept of a planetary digital twin, of course, is, is our holy grail, I suppose, in the geospatial world. Um, but clearly that would require an enormous investment and such a huge amount of collaboration on the part of international governments and so on, that clearly it's a very, very long way away, even if it's ever achievable. But um, I completely agree with Mark. We, in the meantime, can get on with building a platform for information exchange, you know, between digital twins of all scales, whether it's an individual building or a transportation network, or even modeling the material flow of manufactured goods, um, you know, raw materials through to production of concrete as an example. So 
we can create digital twins of all of those um, processes and workflows and the movement of all of these things around our planet. Um, and the important thing is that we can exchange information about it. And I guess my, 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 my theory or my belief is that geography is one of those contextual frameworks, which at least allows us to talk about the same piece of land or the same network or the same mine to, you know, to, to building site. We can all at least understand one another. You know, and the more that we can understand one another and collaborate, the faster we'll be able to change our thinking. So that really conceptually is what I mean by a planetary digital twin is the ability for us to understand what's going on where, having a sensible framework through which we can discuss it and pass information from one phase to the next, because that is often where information either gets lost or misinterpreted or just doesn't even make it, you know, so we have to be able to find an information exchange. And my belief is that geography is, is fundamental to that. Mm. And by that comment, uh, Chris, when you mentioned we need to pass information from one part to another, I feel that it connects to what Khadija was talking about when it comes to the, the first uh, life, the second life, and the end of life. And I think we've got a question here on, on the building stock. But just before I jump into that question, uh, one aspect uh, which to connect also to the science fiction perspective of it, uh, that if we take concrete as a possibility of taking up CO2 as well, uh, that could kind of add to the question uh, that is go ongoing right now with the EU taxonomy, where we are discussing, okay, what could be a sustainable uh, investment? And if we can also add on the uptake of CO2 to concrete, is that something that is going to change? So I know that is a huge question, but it could also be a, a contribution to uh, to uh, that as well. But uh, Khadija, what are your takes on uh, on both that global model, but also connecting it to the life cycle perspectives of, of uh, your, uh, your work? Yeah, I think uh, picking up on both comments from both um, um, uh, for Mark and, and Chris, I think collaboration, as, as Chris just mentioned, collaboration and communication is really key and we are really feeling that uh, by trying to build this model because we are juggling different databases, different technologies, we need to, well, of course, the, the model is based on GIS, but then you need to incorporate more, more detail, like to, to understand what's in the buildings. You need to bring BIM technology as well, BIM data sets. Then you have the life cycle assessment, which is usually used by different types of, of, um, of stakeholders. And that can be very disconnected from, from the, maybe the, the BIM technology. So bringing all of this together and trying to communicate and, and pass the information from one to the other is really the biggest challenge. And I think once we can we can do that and interconnect all these these tools that we have and, and being able to apply them to to a digital twin, that this will be a huge I think it's a big challenge and it will be a huge uh, achievement. And yeah, it's not trivial. <laughs> So there's a question for you here, Khadija, from Alexander that connects to uh, that CO2 uptake. So thank you for your presentation. How much carbon can concrete take up in the best case? How much is it compared to bio-based materials, for example, timber? And that's also a question that I would like to have answered. <laughs> so thank you, Alexander. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a really good question. Actually, of course, we're not doing better than, t than timber. I won't say that, but then there... So there, that really depends on, on many factors, like on the exposure area of the concrete, on the type of concrete or mortar that we're talking about. There, there have been many studies, uh, both at the global scale and then uh, at national scales, for example, in the US, in China. And um, Sweden ha is actually one of the, the, the first countries that, that undertook this type of, of, uh, of models. And so, yeah, number indicate depending on what we are looking at, like, for example, of course, the mortar of, of envelopes is usually the larger uh, uh, exposed facade. And then depending on, on climate data as well, that's another data set that you need to have. So on, on humidity um, that you have in, in your particular city and different times of the year and so so how how much area is exposed what are the external the external climate factors 
and so and so on. So it can reach up to uh, forty percent uh, uh, compared to the initial emissions that were uh, released during the um, the manufacturing of the of the clinker. Uh, so that's what we take at, as a theoretical maximum. You could uh, throughout uh, the the whole primary life of, of the the building, which is usually assumed to be around a hundred years, you could take up uh, up to forty percent of those initial emissions. And then a very interesting thing is that the end of life of the building when it when it is de demolished and the carbon that you have more exposed area of of of, um, of concrete when when it's stockpiled uh, during like when you demolish the building and you ju you just put it somewhere uh, just put the car the the concrete uh, just in a warehouse or something as you have an increased exposed area carbonation happens even faster so here that that makes it interested in the in interesting in the in the in the sense that you can study different end of life scenarios and being like to optimize that carbon uptake that's a very interesting and untapped uh, area of research as well that we're looking at thank you Karida. so there's a question that kind of fits into that and i think uh Bent will bring it on stage from uh, from leonardo that connects to the building stock which will also uh connect to more. So let's see here, very interesting talk and it connects to you, Mark, as well. I agree with the system of systems perspective. How do you think it will be possible to map the already existing stock? So uh, Mark, what's your take on this question? Yeah, it, it, it's essential that we do be, because um, uh, we need to get more out of what we've already got. You know, some, somebody said uh, that the, the lowest carbon building to build is the one that's already built. Uh, we we need to make the make use of what we've already got, and and not just think that we knock it down and build build new ones. Um, <clears throat> I mean, at, at the moment in the UK, uh, we have something like ninety nine point five percent of the infrastructure we need, uh, and each year we add 05 percent to it. Uh, and so the the existing is of massive importance. The industry generally talks about the new stuff, uh, and and the new stuff is. Is really important too. You know, the construction industry is worth something like nine percent of GDP in the UK. So you know that that 0.5 percent really matters, but so does the 99.5 percent. And so I think uh, you know if if we're going to do this thing we're talking about, we absolutely have to be uh, adding in the um, existing buildings and existing infrastructure into this digital twin picture. Uh, and so I think it's more than just mapping. Uh, and the mapping is really important, you know, and Chris is really strong on that and the, the kind of the whole piece about the, the kind of the geospatial data. Um, but but so is the geometric data uh, and so um, is the in-use data, which we can get from from sensors. So, so I'm not suggesting that we go uh, and make a massive map of of everything and that we go and put sensors on everything. Uh, what we what we say within the uh, the National Digital Twin Programme is that each digital twin should be driven by purpose uh, and then the ecosystem of digital twins should also be driven by purpose. So effectively it, get, it gets built one purpose at a time. Each digital twin on purpose, each connection between digital twins on, on purpose. And so it grows in a much more kind of organic kind of way to represent the um, the built environment that itself has grown in a very organic way. But, but it's kind of a long way around saying we totally have to take on board the existing stock. You know, that, that's, that's actually the, the bit that matters. And just one more thought on this is that if, if all we do is um, kind of apply the digital twin thinking to the new stuff uh, and we take on board my 0.5% versus 99.5%, it would take 200 years to build that out across our built environment. We don't have 200 years. So it's an absolute imperative that we do this thing that we're talking about to the existing stock. Thank you, Mark. So let's uh, connect that with Chris as well. As you mentioned, that Chris has solutions for these uh, questions as well. But uh, it's really interesting, as you mentioned, the, the built environment that we already have is what we're going to still have for a really long time. And that also connects, I would say, to Khadija's your earlier uh, work as well when it comes to passive houses. Because how can we think about the existing stock and repurpose that and, and make sure that it becomes more energy efficient, more material efficient? and by not knocking it down, by keeping it up. So, uh, Chris, what's your take on? Yeah, on I, think that I completely agree with Mark. 
you know, we, we have to do better with what we already have. And I think there's a lot to be said in this context to changing the behaviors and mindset of the people that use the buildings. You know, um, COVID-19, unfortunately, has had a huge impact on the way that people move around the city, the requirement for office space, the requirement for residential space, um, the requirement for retail services and so on. So we're already seeing in the commercial real estate sector a really rapidly changing um, requirement from occupiers around what they need and what they're prepared to lease. So, you know, we, we might have to do a certain amount of mind shifting or, or, you know, getting over the muscle memory of what we always used to want compared to what we already have. And is it satisfactory to have the interior space remodeled rather than just simply you know uh, casting aside an option to use a, a let's say an older building because its appearance or its fabric isn't quite what we would like so along with measuring and finding ways to retrofit existing building stock i think that part of the challenge here and indeed part of the challenge with the circular economy principles is is getting um, uh, a, com a sort of a, a, a communal mind share around what the purpose of the uh, of the city really is, um, and there's a lot we can do there to help citizens and commuters of cities to understand the consequence of the choices that they're making. You know, and a lot of that I would say comes down to visualization, being able to show the flow of people through a through a city centre, through a transportation network, and so on. And Khalidia, your uh, perspectives on, on mapping the, the, the existing stock, it feels that that is part of also your project since you're uh, involving and looking at the entire uh, stock as well. But what's your perspective here? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I feel like what we've been feeling with this work is that we actually, when we look at renovating existing buildings, which is what we should be doing, of course, and today renovation rates in Europe are only around 1%. Um, and, and the answer of that, and, and at the same time, we need to reach those, those zero carbon targets that are set for 2050. And the answer comes down to costs, actually, and to the, to the so renovation is a very uncertain investment. We don't know. Um, it requires very high upfront costs and then the energy cost savings benefits are usually a rough estimate, you know. So so when the reality is that we, and what we realize with our work is that we know very little about the buildings and we have to do as designers sometimes very broad assumptions that that increase this, I mean, that make th that risk so, so big that we are not really... Um, uh, investing as much as as much as we should in rehabilitation, and I think digital twins um, are are a key tool for for that to help that to yeah. And I think there's a question here from uh, Margarita that connects uh, to this as well. So uh, let's see if we can get that one on stage. So here's the question: How can we quantify and monitor material and information flows in this context? And further, how can we assess the impact of digital twins on circularity? Are there any available resources already? Uh, Khadija, do you have any uh, comments on this one? Or is there a... Yeah, still that's a the $1 million question, <laughs> actually. I think it's very site-specific. And uh, I, from my side, I can talk about the reality here. And, and that's, that, um, that's linked to what I said previously about having to juggle so many different data sets and so many different shape files and, and clean them up and make that they can communicate with one another. So basically, yeah, the, the, that's the main difficulty is uh, trying to make that digital twin as accurate as possible. And the power of digital twins is that, is that they can be uh, fed with real time data and upgraded constantly. So that's a major uh, benefit that, that that's totally um, yeah, crucial for, for, yeah, to enable uh, circular economy. And Chris, the million dollar question, is that something that you're supplying or do you have any uh, perspectives on if there are any resources like this already? Uh, well, there's a huge amount of resource out there about the um, climate data and transportation data. Um, 
we worked with the uh, United Nations on a on a portal called SDGsToday.org. I'd recommend it to you. It's a great resource of global data around all of the 17 themes of the SDGs. Um, so in the sense of giving people an insight into how you can start to use different types of information and layer up a picture of material flow, then I think that's a really helpful starting point. Um, but you know that I guess it, it, it is it is going to be a challenge because there's lots of different ways to do this sort of analysis, you know, um, uh, material flow analysis or urban metabolism, all of these things are designed to try to get a better understanding of, of, of the information um, that, that we can gather. Um, so again, I would just come back to say that in all of these things, for me as a geographer, it's too easy, right? It's too easy to say, make sure that you would at least try to think about how to visualize that data, because it might just give you a different way of, of coming to an answer. And Mark, what's your take on this million dollar question? Yeah, I, I, I think um, Chris is right. The, the, the visualization is a, is a key part of the picture. Um, I might like to add in a few other bits, which I think are key parts of the picture too. Um, because I, th I think with within a digital twin, um, that, you know, there's the whole thing about ingesting data and, and managing data properly so that we can generate the insights uh, and then the insights lead to the better decisions. And we think it's making better decisions faster uh, is kind of the, the core purpose um, that probably unites um, digital twins. Um, and um, then those better decisions can drive better interventions, better interventions can drive better outcomes. And that's a kind of an information value chain, but the bit in the middle that, that enables it all is making better decisions faster. Uh, so I think that's that's the core of it. I think that visualization is really important in that because humans have to see in and, and kind of see what's going on inside the digital twin. But but I, I think I think it's it's clearly more than than the visualization. And then if, if we like this idea um, of federating digital twins and making the connection between them, because we can imagine there's going to be lots of different digital twins for lots of different purposes, then the connection is, is also an incredibly important thing. And, and, and maybe I didn't emphasize it so much in, in my talk, but I think that this ends up being a, an absolute key enabler um, that you know, we need to have that interoperability uh, to facilitate federation. If if we don't do that, then what's going to happen is that people are going to write bespoke point-to-point -point solutions. You know, they're going to create an API, manage to get some data shared from one digital twin to another. But in, if everyone then writes their own bespoke solution, uh, then it, it ends up being a kind of a, a, a massive mess. Um, so, so I think that um, for me, part of answering the million dollar question is actually cracking this interoperability problem uh, and enabling secure, resilient data sharing across organizational and sector boundaries. If we can do that, then we reduce the friction of data sharing and we make this federation thing possible. If we don't do that, uh, then I think that um, you know, the N-squared nature of the network will, will mean that it, it just ends up being too much of a mess to benefit from the thing that we've been talking about. However, if we do crack it, then we've got all the possibilities of connected digital twins. So for me, that that's actually the the for me that's the big take on the uh, on the million dollar question. Thank you. So I got two more questions that I'm going to dive into before we end. But there was just one thing that you mentioned quickly there, Chris, uh, on industrial uh, and urban symbiosis, and that could be also seen as an, a vital part of uh, the circular economy. And Mark, you mentioned also that uh, the waste system, how can we move from having a linear waste system to uh, enabling it to be seen as resources instead? Uh, and just a quick question from, from all of you. How do you think we can enable that in a better way? Is that through these federated uh, digital twins or how can we help uh, businesses and companies and municipalities to create a better symbiosis between industries? Maybe Chris, if you would like to start. Yeah, I mean, I see it is, it is going to be one of the big challenges, isn't it? Is how do we effectively model the movement of um, goods and materials from their point of origin to within the city construct um, and then to wherever they end up being either recycled or reused or, or you know, hopefully with a plan to try to minimise the waste at end of life. Um, so, and, and obviously the, the challenge there again is that 
often the raw materials are, are, are not located anywhere near the city. You know, they could be coming from hundreds or thousands of miles away, you know, if you take mineral extraction, uh, for example. So there's a, there's a need for um, governments to collaborate around how do we make sure that when we're considering the value of materials and the residual value of materials, where does that benefit come or who, who becomes the recipient of that benefit? Um, so there's a, there's a deeply, deeply complex challenge around understanding how to achieve true circularity in that sense, because, as I mentioned at the outset, natural systems don't observe boundaries, political or otherwise, you know, they, they, they just work, they're, they're designed to work in that sense. Um, so I, th I think it is a, a massive challenge, but clearly, as Mark said, you know, the more information that we've got, the better we can start to start to make faster decisions. Um, so I think digital twins in, in, in that way have to be an enabler. Um, we've just got to make sure that we can get information out of them quickly and, and get to the decision making. Yeah. And Mark, a quick comment on industrial symbiosis, waste and uh, as resources perspective. Yeah, I, I hope I'm not going to say the wrong thing. I, th I think I might be in, in the, the company where, where, where it might sound like the wrong thing, but I, I really hope it's not. Because because I, I think that we we need to create a uh, a, a beneficial market in this place, because um, what we can see with um, uh, with the materials and and managing materials through many life cycles, you, you know, where you you might see some uh, some steel in in a bridge at one one moment and then in a fridge another and then uh, it turns up again and it's a uh, it's something else. Uh, is it, in managing those resources through multiple life cycles is that there does have to be a market for it. Right. And so I think what we have to do is, is enable that market. Uh, and it really comes down to, you know, the management of both the flow and the stock. And it's quite interesting that, you know, when those materials are incorporated into the built environment, it's basically just a stock. It's, right. it's kind of, it's looking after the resource until it's ne next needed in, in its next form. Uh, and and we have the technology to you know and the language to cope with this you know it, there's complexity science um, there's systems engineering you know, there's a whole thing about um, managing um, energy and mass we, we we can do this kind of stuff um, but to enable it you kind of need to have um, a functioning market uh, and I I think that that will end up being a um, you know a key in making this this whole thing work. And uh, Khadija, a final word on, on that as well from your perspective. Yeah, on, on that I would just add, like concretely, for example, in the case of buildings that would be, for example, coupling BIM with GIS and having like uh, a geo-referenced uh, database of, of building components, for example, that like mapping them. On, on a, in our city and knowing what's in what in which building and what can what will be available uh, as uh, to be used what is a stock what what has just been put there like having kind of a dynamic uh, georeference database of of what's there and what's available for industry to to go there and and pick um, materials that would ideally be what I would imagine as a as a product to be able to do that. Let's go for the final question before we end uh, today. Uh, Bernd, you can add it on, on screen. And I'll, there we go. So I'm going to get a second question here. Could you mention, just for a final one, any applied cases or best practices where digital twin models uh, that have been used in life cycle assessments uh, so that we get a, a, a real world uh, connection? Do you have any of those really quick Applied cases, one one each. Let's start with Mark. Um, I, I probably shouldn't mention the, the name of the uh, the client organisation, but uh, a big owner operator in in the UK um, using oh. digital twins very effectively in uh, in in life like in in part of the life cycle. I, th I think that um, I don't know of um, an effective digital twin that manages all the way through the whole life cycle. But I don't think it needs to. I think digital twin needs to be driven by purpose. And if it's if it's succeeding on one particular purpose in part of the life cycle, that's good enough for now, as long as it's then connected in the future to manage the rest of the life cycle. But but yes, there are good examples uh, of digital twins helping to manage part of the life cycle. 
Uh, Khadija, any? One yeah, I would say the same. From from the top of my head, I don't know any any that uses the full life cycle. What we're trying to do is uh, at least a few stages of it, and I'm sure. Yeah, and there are many good examples of that. Okay. And Chris, you get the final word. <laughs> Final word, okay. Well, I shan't talk about LCAs then. I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps, if you'll forgive me, I'll use one of my favourite quotes from Richard Saul Werman, who's the father of TED, the TED Talks, who, uh, who, who summarises for me all of this, which is understanding precedes action, you know, and anything that we can do with digital twins that helps us to accelerate our understanding in the way that Mark's alluded um, can only help us put this into action. And obviously, we know the imperative. We know that the planet is deeply in trouble. Well, actually, humankind is deeply in trouble, not the planet. The planet will keep revolving. But uh, the faster we can improve our understanding, the quicker we can take action. Good. Thank you very much. So uh, Khadija, Chris and Mark, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, it was really interesting thank to listen to all of your different perspectives. I'm going to bring uh, Bant back in here so he can say a final word for uh, from this uh, seminar. Uh, but it's true Corona style, I'm going to leave the room. Very good. Yeah, we're really good at social distancing, distancing here in Sweden. That's uh, kind of in our, uh, in our nature, I would say. I want to add my thanks to you guys. It was a great session. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, it's the last one now. And um, yeah, I guess it's time also to wrap up a little bit, to conclude a little bit. Um, I think we learned that digital twins have massive, massive potential for our cities and our built environment. I think Adam and our Adam Beck in our first um, in our first uh, session said that. Uh, it's the most powerful data platform of all time. Um, so I'm not sure that's an overstatement, but it is certainly, it underlines that there is a lot of great capabilities that enable smart uh, and livable cities, community engagement, but also circular economies that, as we learned today. I think we also learned that technology is definitely not the problem, um, but we need to really make sure that it's about the people and about real problems. If we really can do that, then I think uh, that's half the way there. And we also learned that we need to have strategic standards that everybody, um, that every get, gets everybody on the same level uh, playing field and uh, that builds consensus across sectors. I think that's very important. In our last session, we, we learned we need to have, we need to widen our scope also in a way that we include other disciplines and other professions and not only engineers. I think that's very crucial when it comes to citizen engagement and other topics. So I think there is, um, there's a lot to do for us, um, and we're gonna keep that discussion uh, up. We're gonna keep discussing with our friends at CDBB and Mark and uh, across, uh, across the Atlantic to uh, uh, the United States and Australia. So we will reach out a lot and we will continue to have this discussion. Um, to stay updated, please uh, follow our website, any updates there, dtcc.chalmers.se, and please also consider to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more resources. I want to thank you for your interest. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon. See you soon.